How appropriate to begin this 90th anniversary documentary of the Parkersburg High School a cappella choir with Lord Have Mercy on Us, sung in Russian so convincingly by the 1957-58 choir under Esther Cunningham. I'm going to take just this moment to thank those who contributed to my video um, with the different documents and pictures and recordings that really made this video happen and allowed me to share my passion for the history of the PHS Alcapella Choir. I want to show you some of the components that were used, uh, the recordings. Dottie Satterfield was the daughter of, of uh, Satterfield Music Store owner. And uh, before the store broke up, she gathered a bunch of records from the basement where the, her father's archives were stored. And unfortunately, she took them to Florida and they got stored in a very hot garage. And these recordings are of no good because they just have very little music on them. And what music is left is distorted and fried. So I'm so sorry that we don't have more recordings from the Satterfield archives of the music history of Parkersburg. But several people that were sang in those choirs did send me very good quality records. This was shared by Marta Wilson in the class of 50, 59. Uh, her records looked like this. Very beautiful shape, not a scratch, and in the sleeves and not heat treated like the Florida ones got. But in any case, it's a very good recording and I, I know you're gonna enjoy hearing some selections from these recordings. During my era, I had Mr. Satterfield make me tape recordings, which are even better than the records he made. And in here are the tapes of my concerts of uh, 62 or 61, this one is Christmas of 61. And uh, then we have uh, the uh, May of 62. So those two recordings I have original tapes of, which are much higher quality. But in any case, it's nice to have saved these artifacts that, that are fun to go back and listen to and to preserve in a more current format. This is my Parkersburg room, as you may have observed by now. My father collected trolley memorabilia back in the 40s when they were being scrapped. And uh, of course, this painting, the Sixth Street Station, we don't want to forget about. That's no longer there, but there it is in our minds and our picture. Uh, the trolley going around City Hall Square, painted by Mike Penn so beautifully. And my father's fam uh, camera collection. But here we are down to our cell phones, making the pictures and the videos. And uh, it's great to be able to preserve in this way. And I hope you'll enjoy this video. Let's begin with the family of Marie Bodie. Her father immigrated to Baltimore from Geisel, Germany in the late 1860s. Reading the detailed family history written by Marie, we see that she was the only daughter born into this large family with eight brothers. I'm sure she was treated very special and was driven by a lot of competition with her brothers. She shared her house on Avery Street, living with one of her brothers at the last portion of their lives.
thanks to Parkersburg resident Larry Townsend for finding this rare record of the Parkersburg High School Mercado Glee Club under the direction of Marie Bodie in the early 1930s. This document, provided by Jeff Little, shows that there were nine singers from Parkersburg High School that were chosen to go to a national high school choir convention in Detroit, Michigan, on February 21st. Now, mind you, an ad hoc version of the a cappella choir had already sung some pieces in a program that they shared with the high school orchestra on February 15th, 1931. Marta Wilson found this program in her mother's collection. Garnet Swain was her maiden name, and she was one of those nine singers that went to Detroit and helped found the Alcapella Choir. So this is a very historic document here. Here's the other document provided by Jeff Little that really proves when the choir was organized. In 1931, it was May that they had their first meeting and decided uh, direction they were going to go. And Jeff Little found this rare pre-Parkersburg High School Journal edition of what's called the Antenna. And those are rare as can be. Nobody seems to find those in any of their scrapbooks or anything but the what an important document he brought in his choir history.
I'll tell you how I got to know Dr. Bodhi pretty well. Uh, I, I have taught at Ohio Valley University for 52 years. It was Ohio Valley College then. And in 1964, we, we got the showboat rhododendron and put on a show on the rhododendron. It was the West Virginia Centennial Boat. Oh, okay. And so anyway, the students and some of the faculty and staff put on a show. And I was part of a quartet uh, musical. It was called uh, The Sunday Excursion. And it had a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. The pianist was our soprano, mm -hmm. so she couldn't accompany us. So Dr. Bodhi accompanied us, and we practiced in her home. She had a second-story home on Margaret or Julianne, I don't remember. She had a brother who lived with her. Okay. What was her personality like? Was she, like she was very definite, very, very out front, almost demanding but she knew who she was. The word I was looking for was imperious. She had a sense of entitlement, mm -hmm. uh, but a delightful woman, I mean. Uh, but you know, if, if you hit a note wrong, she was, she was right there. And I, but I remember, she was probably 80 years old about this time, but when she played the piano, she played it real hard. I mean, it wasn't anything soft. I mean, she just went after those keys. And I remember, she's going to break her fingers. She's hitting them so hard. Dr. Marie Bodie, she was born in Parkersburg, West Virginia in 1895. She graduated from high school in 1913 and began teaching music in local public schools a few years later. She soon became Wood County's first supervisor of music. She received her BS in music from New York University in 1934. In 1936, Marie joined the music faculty at West Virginia Wesleyan. She received her MA from Ohio University in 1942. Graduate school field work led to a lifelong interest in mountain ballads. The culmination of her research came in 1971 with the publication of Sing a Hipsy Doodle and Other Folk Songs of West Virginia. This book includes the words and music of nearly 100 songs collected from the mid-1930s to 1969. In 1954, she received an honorary doctor of music degree from Davis and Elkins College. Dr. Bodie composed the West Virginia Centennial Song in 1963. Young Marie Bodie was named Parkersburg's Woman of 1920. In 1980, her native city again honored her with a Festival of American Heritage Music. In 1982, a Marie Bodie Endowment for Pipe Organ Students was established at West Virginia Wesleyan. In 1982, she also received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from, West, from Wesleyan. As a dedicated music teacher, Marie Bodie considers her thousands of students to be her greatest contribution. We honor her as well for other legacy, the collection of folk songs she assembled over a lifetime. And on a personal note, I can say that if it weren't for Marie Bodie, many of the priceless treasures of our culture would be lost forever. Marie, it's a great pleasure for me to honor you on behalf of the Vandalia family and to present you with this distinguished West Virginia award presented to Marie Bodie for outstanding achievement and meritorious service. The state of West Virginia hereby recognizes your exceptional accomplishment and confers this accommodation in your name. In testimony whereof, we cause the great seal of the state to be affixed down at Charleston this 27th day of May and the year 1989, Gaston Caperton Governor. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Marie Bodie. Hear me.
Thank you all. Thank you all so very, very much. I really had a speech, and believe it or not, it's in my pocketbook that, that someone is carrying for me. <laughs> so I won't give you a speech, but it, my life has been music. And uh, I have had so many wonderful experiences with it. And uh, I, I just uh, hope that all of you will carry on whatever you like to do and have the joy of meeting people and helping others as we go along day by day. Now I do have a song that I remember and I don't need my book for, so I'm gonna sing it for you. <laughs> That's my final. <laughs> oh, brother, now our meeting's broke and brother and we must part. And if I never more see you, I'll love you in my heart. When we land on that shore, and we'll shout forevermore. When we land on that shore, and we'll shout forevermore.
Okay, this is Aunt Janie here, and we're here for her 95th birthday and down in uh, Hewitt, Texas, and we had a great time last night. So in this film, I want to capture some of her memories of the PHS Al Capella Choir, which we are all so proud to have been in. So what were your experiences uh, coming into the school and, and taking the music classes that you had to do to get into that choir? So I took sight singing and dictation under Mr. Withers. And of course it was easy for me because I already knew my scales. I knew how to sight read pretty well. He gave us uh, little exercises to sing, a uh, sight reading. So that's what you had to do to get into the a cappella choir at that time. They, he uh, or, yeah, asked us to be in Mercado Glee Club, which really none of us wanted to, but if that's what he said as a rule, I, of course we would do it. About Christmas time, he chose a quartet. He divided the class up in quartets. And I was very fortunate. I, I felt the best tenor, alto, and soprano, tenor, alto, and baritone or bass. I were in my little group, and we met at uh, my home, which was on 23rd and Oak Street, right about three blocks from the high school. We met an evening or two before and practiced well, so we know what we're doing. And we sang at Christmas Carol. We got along wonderfully well. I'm so thankful because uh, he was pleased, I could tell that. Our homerooms, everybody had a homeroom. So the last, say, 30 minutes of the day, you're in your homeroom. And uh, somebody came in the room, as they usually did, and gave a note to the teacher uh, at, the, at the class, at the head of the class. And then they just walked on out, the teacher walked back, came back to my seat, and handed it to me. And it said, inquire for the next year, which probably would have been, um, uh, let's see, 39 to 40. Yeah, 39 to 40. Did you all know that Mrs. Mrs. Abels was coming? Before no. That? And when we heard Mr. Withers was leaving, of course, we thought, oh, how did that have to happen? Well, the next year, Miss Abels came in and she chose the most wonderful music. We realized, wait, we have a great teacher here. We didn't know what a wonderful teacher we were getting. And so we were so thankful to have Miss Abels, uh, who, of course, became later Mrs. Cunningham, one of the greatest teachers. As far as I'm concerned, I think she's the greatest that ever was a part of her high school. Now, there may be some good ones since, of course, uh, but uh, this lady chose the finest music. Uh, I went to Westminster Choir College later, uh, after I graduated from high school, and the music that they taught up there was like the music Mrs. Cunningham had taught us. So we were so, or Miss Abel's for us, we were so fortunate to have her. Yeah. We were very pleased with her. So did she immediately find uh, places for you to sing outside the school, like at her church? Did you yes, sing? we sang at the First Baptist Church. First, that was one of our first places, but that was a joy. And uh, we did a lovely Christmas program there, and they were so wonderful, such wonderful people. Uh, we sang different places. Would you have done the Messiah in those years at the churches or not at Christmas time? We did the Messiah one year. That's what got me on the Messiah. We did it one year, and it was wonderful because we learned the Christmas portion of the Messiah. We learned it perfect because she's very strict. You already know your part if you're yeah. in Miss Cunningham's class. So you did that besides the choir concert. I mean, that was yes. an outside program. Right? Well, we outside. did it there. We did it for our Christmas program one year, exactly. The yeah. orchestra was pretty good back in those years. Well, we yeah. probably we had Mr. Mike. Swales. I remember Mr. Swales, Professor Swales. <laughs> he was a sweetheart. And uh, the kids played. I thought they played well. One of the biggest mysteries in researching Esther Cunningham came to me when I found her Periskin of 1929, her senior year, and the entry that was next to her picture. I researched Northwestern University and found that she did indeed attend there. The, whether it was the next year or not, uh, they couldn't, they didn't give me that information, but they showed in the 1931 Northwestern Annual that she was in a sorority, and that's the only information I have on that school, but I, uh, I don't know if she graduated from there. We know that she graduated from Cincinnati Conservatory later on, but uh, why she didn't include the choirs or the glee clubs that she sang in in high school is a big mystery. And also, uh, in any of her write-ups, it never talks about the teachers that she would have had in her grade school, high school years that would have trained her on piano. She had to be very good to get into the Cincinnati Conservatory. 
And I just uh, am mystified as to who those teachers were and why we don't see the listings of her in the glee clubs of her high school years. I was thinking of Doris Fleming, who was my music teacher at Washington Junior. I paid her, I don't know, like a summer or something like that. And she gave me lessons, but really I wasn't with her very long. And she had us, uh, the whole class, and they were supposed to get up and do something uh, in the class, a musical. Uh -huh. And I sang a song, and she heard my voice, and she said, oh, boy. <laughs> so she told the whole school, I guess, that I sang. As we view this beautiful first known color picture of the a cappella choir, I want to talk a little bit about the all-state experience for a cappella choir members. It began as early as 1934 uh, that I could find in the archives, but uh, when Esther Cunningham became director of the choir, her keyboard talents were quickly known to the West Virginia music educators, and they appointed her as the accompanist for the great events of the All-State Chorus. And here she is playing one of our favorites from my year in the choir, in the All-State Chorus, America from West Side Story.
We shouldn't forget the close and supportive relationship that Esther Cunningham had with stage and artistic director Isabel Wilson pretty much through the years that she was there. Mrs. Wilson provided those beautiful stage sets and her artistic ability with stage lighting was just incomparable anywhere in the area. So uh, that relationship showed up early on and here's some examples of uh, her fine work. This got featured on the 1950 National Scholastic Roto magazine and it was a door of a cathedral with a stained glass window in the distance so I would love to have seen that in person, but here's a nice photo with some of the acapella members that made the front page of Roto in 1950. Here's another spectacular Christmas concert stage setting, and I'm not sure of the year. I wish somebody could help me find the year of this, and I'm not sure of who I got this picture from, but what a spectacular stage setting with the altar rails, installed and the stairway in the middle of the stage more or less We went to Gettysburg, and then we went on to Washington. But what happened was a lot of us had never been in a hotel before, and we treated it like a dormitory. And kids were running up and down the hall, in and out of their rooms. There were two to four to a room, making all kinds of noise, disturbing everybody around. And I remember the floor walker came up once and caught me in the hall in my pajamas. <laughs> and then she came up and checked in every room, and we all pretended to be asleep. Yeah. And I heard uh, one woman's voice as she went by, I'm leaving this hotel, and I'm never coming back here, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, oh, so anyway, instead of being nice little kids, we yeah. were teenage brats. So the next day, we were to sing for Harry Truman in church which we did, and it was the first time I had seen how they do when a president comes. There was no one in the row in front of him or beside him or behind him for mm. several rows. Mm -hmm. He sat by himself, and we sang, and she thought we were horrible. So, oh, she just laid into us. Then the next year, we weren't allowed to go anywhere because we had acted so bad. <laughs> but the next year, anyway, she was gone, and Mrs. Houston had the choir for our senior year. Yeah, now what was she like, and uh, what do you remember about her? She was a lovely person. She mm -hmm. was an absolutely lovely person, but she wasn't the teacher that Esther Cunningham was. I started in singing in the seventh grade in the glee clubs, mm -hmm. and she had one, and I don't remember which one, and Miss Allen had one, and then I think she had another one, and then, uh, of course, Mrs. Cunningham had voice, which we took before we could get into choir, and I was in choir for the two years. Well, those glee clubs that you were in before choir, were those... Uh like you met during homeroom period or lunch hour, or when did you rehearse? As a matter of fact, I just ran into some credit slips here. Oh. <laughs> uh, homeroom, Glee Club, Lorraine Allen, two Great. hours a week, I, the credits I got. And then sophomore chorus, Helen Houston, one hour a week on that. Thinking about that picture of you in that beautiful dress, do you remember the store you bought it in and who went with you to pick it out and all that? The one in the notorious green dress, that was a true dress from the 20s. They would have these operettas, which were terribly cheesy, but they would have them. Mm -hmm. And nobody would teach us anything about acting. We just more or less got up there and said lines. Yeah. And Mrs. Houston, of course, would have had the senior one. And she didn't know anything about how to do that. Yeah. But it's as though the departments did not coordinate on things like that. There was a lot of jealousy between departments. We had a conflict in thespians, okay? Mm -hmm. The president of the thespians, Fred something, I'd have to look him up, 
was also an a cappella choir. Mm-hmm. And there was something big coming up that he was supposed to do as president of Thespians. Mm-hmm. It also conflicted with something the a cappella choir had to do. Mm. So he was going to resign and didn't because we voted no for him not to, and he chose to do the choir thing. From all accounts, this was probably the very first PHS review. Uh, In the 1940s, the programs don't show up so easily, but uh, nobody has come up with anything before 1950 in their review. We uh, had our own piano, and they started me with piano lessons, and I think I probably was maybe seven Mm -hmm. at that time. And that was with Mrs. Flesher, Grace Flesher. And, uh, okay. but anyway, I think she taught most of the children in Vienna who are my age now. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you guys gave recitals every year? No, or? well, not with her. Looking back, she was really a good teacher as far as teaching the beginnings of reading and, and mm-hmm. rhythm. And we used John Williams. Mm-hmm. We went through the Williams uh, <clears throat> series mm-hmm. and she taught me to play hymns. Mm. When my mother's family my uncles and aunts and cousins would get together. We usually ended up singing hymns, mm-hmm. and I could, I got, you know, <laughs> along the way, I became able to play, yeah. play the hymns, yeah. and I uh, continued with the piano and and went on with Mrs. Cunningham. Mm-hmm. Well, I think any anybody who was a member of a cappella will have pleasant memories, yes. uh, mm-hmm. and, and consider it a real honor and privilege to have been able to be a part of it. What year did you start studying with Mrs. Cunningham? Probably sixth sixth or seventh grade and went went through high school. Now do you remember those recitals that you had with her being uh, a big big group of kids that would play? (laughs) uh... Uh, uh, Yeah, I remember the the recitals that she had at her home. Mm -hmm. And oh, that was (laughs) (laughs) nerve-wracking. I was always really nervous. And she required her students to memorize their pieces. So. Oh, absolutely. And that, that, was, uh, that was the hard part. So, uh, I want to talk about your actual singing, the part that you were a soprano. But were you a first soprano? First soprano, yes. So you always sing the high notes on the end of those things? Yeah. Those, <laughs> well, those were tough. I mean, I, those recordings, I hear those high notes on the end. Of How they, did they sound? They sound good. There's not too many of you doing it, though, right? No.
<laughs> so you had a gift. Always, yeah. had a gift for the high notes. That's great. In, in your time, did you remember her working with a choral sound to try to get blend? Uh, or... Well, yeah, I think so. I think so. Did you? Uh, well, uh, when you would rehearse the ladies, I mean, do you remember trying to match a sound or how would yeah, she teach Yeah, yes, that? I remember that. I I don't know how. I don't know the technique for that she used. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he asked what and yeah, songs yeah. we liked. Yes, in the choir, and that's why I liked. Uh, Oh, Magnum Mysterium. Mm -hmm. You remember Victoria, that one? Yeah, yeah like yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there was one called Oh, oh Sing Your Songs. Mm -hmm. I like that. And Laud Him. Laud Him, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Thompson Hallelujah. Yes. And that's, that oh. was a really a favorite yeah. one. Right. And uh, our arrangement of Now Thank We All Are God. Yes, with well, those runs at the end. Yes, uh, yeah. Was... And of course, the Hallelujah Chorus. <laughs> that was so emotional and, and so traditional, you know. That, yeah. uh, and I liked, of course, the benediction. That, that can, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know what you're learning <laughs> as, right. as you go along. And I think that probably it helped me through all my teaching, you know, some of the, the yeah. disciplines and the, the, the techniques and mm -hmm. things that you don't put your finger on, but you know you have them, maybe. Yeah. I felt, and I think most people did, that we were representing the high school mm -hmm. and we recognized a high degree mm -hmm. of uh, accomplishment and uh, oh. and we thought that's what the school stood for exactly so yeah so i thought that was and i think choir members today still feel that way mm -hmm. come back in 1953 when esther cunningham was there because i had gone to new york to columbia and got my master's but I found out there was an opening there in Parkersburg High School. Cunningham is the one that hired me. Where did you graduate from high school? Oh, I graduated from Calhoun County High School, then WVU, and I taught for a year and then went back for my master's at Columbia. I see. Okay. Then I taught from 53 to 59 when I had my son. Frank Gilbert, remember him? Yeah, the orchestra. The orchestra. He called me and he said, Cassie, there is going to be an opening at Parkerburg High School. Are you interested in coming back here? And I said, of course. But <laughs> so back, I went back in no, 69 to 88. I was out and had two children. So I stayed there. Did you direct the church choir, Annie? No, I never got involved in that. Okay. I uh, had children. Mm -hmm. And I got them to church and to Sunday school and got them involved in everything I could, but no. But I was there in the good years, I guess. I uh, was fortunate enough to uh, be in a cappella uh, 54 and 55, two years. Of course, I've been out of school 66 years now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, but anyway, uh, it was just a blessing. I was in... Um, I'm looking at a picture of you here that I got out of a uh -oh. and a sunny side up, that review where you're, oh, yes. where you're dancing there, two of you. What, yes, and, uh, uh, that's, the other gal is, was, is Janice Grow Hausman. She's, uh, we're still friends, and uh, uh, yes, we did the uh, Ball and the Jack during sunny side, or sunny side Up presentation. Yeah. So what the, did you take voice class then to get in the choir? Or yes, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot about that. No, I remember trying out for a cappella and uh, in front of a class, and uh, it might have been Oh Sacred Head Now no, Winded that we had to sing our own. All she did was just go to the piano and give. I was uh, second alto, uh -huh. just give our first pitch of the, our part on that, and we had to stand there for everyone and sing it, oh, okay. uh, Grella, in in order just to uh, you know see if we would make it or not. Yeah. So I remember when the list when the list of who made our cappella came out, and somebody sneaked in her room, and before school started, we were standing outside and and looked at the list and told us who had made it. We were just cheering before we even went in. <laughs> Oh, but um, well, no, it was a great experience. Very, very good. Of course, you know the Christmas concerts were always so well done. 
We went to Columbus. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, would you remember what you did there? What What was the attraction? Uh, I know why we went. Excuse me. I know why we went to see Sonia Haney ice skating. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> when When spring came in our very last spring concert, I kind of left the auditorium with my parents, and I kind of started crying a little bit. My dad said, "Why are you crying?" But uh, it was a wonderful experience. I can't emphasize enough the connection that I had musically with uh, Esther Cunningham. Yeah. She was the one that gave me everything that I needed to get started and, and to keep going. Mm -hmm. Esther was just a complete musician. I mean, she went off to uh, Fountain Blow and studied with Nadia Boulanger and a number of other people, maybe not every summer, but uh, a number of the summers when I was still taking lessons from her. I mean, uh -huh. she would go off, and she was able to maintain, I think, her own technical skills uh, uh -huh. until a very late age, yeah. when my legs were finally long enough to reach the pedals. <laughs> I think I was 13. And I studied organ, not with Esther, hmm. uh, but with Marie Bodie. Oh, tell me about her personality. and She was a sweetheart. I mean, you know, she was a wonderful person, enthusiastic and exciting. And when I began studying organ with her, she was the organist at the First Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. and that's where I had my organ lessons with her. Burton and I were the ones who always played the little pitch pipe, whatever <laughs> it was. I think we went up to Pittsburgh. I guess it was with the choir. Sometime in high school, we, we went to a Pittsburgh Steelers football game. I think we stopped in Columbus and saw a concert by the four freshmen backed up with the Ted Heath Orchestra. And <laughs> that's when I became a big fan of the freshmen and the Ted Heath. I mean, I had all these records. That's the only trip I remember the choir taking when I was in there. Yeah. Male quartets have long been a popular genre in the music program at PHS. This article from 1913 really shocked me that it was that far back. Unfortunately, the earliest recording I can find are the ones with my brothers in it from 1955 and 1957. So I'm going to show those uh, two clips that I found, which I think you'll find interesting. Mickey Mouse Club, Mickey Mouse Club, who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? M-I-C-K-Y-M-O-U-S-E-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R
I think it was in October, I was a senior, and she came to me one day and she said, I was a very, very shy child and teenager, just painfully shy, and she came to me and she said, Phil, I want you to sing the senior solo this year, and I said, Mrs. Cunningham, I can't do that, I can't, and she said, she pointed her finger, she says, you can and you will. <laughs> and she said, I will meet you in the auditorium and you can stand up on the stage and I'll accompany you and we'll rehearse. Oh, for two or three weeks, almost every morning, I met her in the auditorium, stood up on the stage and she accompanied me. What was and the solo? Oh, Leave Your Sheep. It was a baritone solo. Uh -huh. And when, when I actually sang it, there were 1,200 people there in the auditorium. Wow. And uh, I was so happy I had on a robe because my old legs were just shaking. <laughs> I can't even shake them as fast as they were shaking then. And I got through it. I don't know how. I thought I was going to die. different choirs at Oxford High School. Took over, took Mrs. Cunningham for voice when I was a sophomore. And did you have theory? Did she get you to take the theory lessons of music theory? Uh, not so much music theory. You know, she always, she was always the teacher, mm -hmm. no matter what the situation. She taught me more of that kind of thing, taking piano lessons. Yes, okay. And you know, I used to play pretty well back in those days, mm -hmm. and then I didn't touch a piano for the next 30 years. <laughs> and it's not like riding a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can play a few simple hymns and silly songs and things yeah. like that. Well, that's great. But I used to, back in those days, I could play Rhapsody in Blue. Wow. This is that we did under uh, Esther Cunningham back in the early 1960s. And the rest of the program is going to be conducted by a woman who has managed to whip this ragtag group of rusty voices into some semblance of a choir we were in the past couple of days the former uh, music director at PHS, and a member of the class of 1960. Two. 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 Kathy Breckenridge Mark. <laughs> Shout, shout. 
recently found this picture from my grade school choir in 1955. It says that we're singing with the high school music festival. I can't imagine how we sounded, but we look pretty sharp with our hand positions. They have gone into business for themselves, more or less, and have called themselves the Cardables. C-H-O-R-D-A-B-L-E-S. Where did you ever get such a name as that? Are you going to be the spokesman? Stand up here with me and let's introduce you and the rest of the gentlemen. You are? Roger Blackburn. Roger Blackburn. And here, and what part do you sing? I sing the bass. And Lou sings bass, and with him he also beats the snare drum with a <laughs> like that, you know. Over here we have Bill Warfield, Bill Warfield, the clarinetist in the big red band, and what part in the quartet? I sing baritone. A baritone. <laughs> and next to him is Larry McKinley. And uh, Larry, what instrument do you play in the big red band? Uh, e flat alto e and flat. Uh, F horn too. Oh, what's an F horn? I've never <laughs> seen one of those. Bigger F, you have to carry that. Around. No, it has a whole great big bunch of tubing, and it's a French horn is what it is. Well, really. a pop French pop horn, guy. yeah. And what are you in the quartet? Second tenor. Second tenor. And last but surely not least, with a voice that sounds just like an angel, we have <laughs> Dave, Dave Kesselring. Dave Kesslering, and Dave, what uh, instrument is yours in the band? Clarinet. And you sing? First tenor. First tenor, and you certainly will hear him sing first tenor. Now, gentlemen, without any further ado, why don't you sound your C on your clarinet and sing for us a barber shop. Today, right now to begin with, on this uh, Gala occasion following our heroes welcome in New York City. They are going to sing Creole Baby, which doesn't have the least bit of connection, I can assure you. So gentlemen, one and two and take it away. Oh, won't you come back and be my baby Down by the Babylon Brook on the bayou Ding dong dolly with the dimple on her knee the devil's there, I know, don't be shy. Creole cutie, won't you cuddle up closer? Never was another one like you, no, so Ding dong, dolly, won't you be my baby now? You're the prettiest girl in the city of Parkersburg. You're the only little doll in all my dreams. There never was another one like you anyhow. Creole cutie, won't you cuddle up closer? Never was another one like you, no sir. Ding dong, darling, won't you be my baby? No, be my pretty little baby. No, be my pretty little baby. Won't you be my baby? Be my baby now. all invited, join us every Monday through Friday at 1 o'clock for a pleasant visit with Coffee with Katie, brought to you in part by Sid's Furniture Mart. It's, uh, it was nice of uh, Mrs. Cunningham to let us practice in her room, uh, 322, yeah. was it? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, she trusted us to be in her room at, at, at noon, and all we did was practice, and it was my boy. I mean, it's wonderful when you can practice every day. Yeah. So that worked out extremely well. Yeah. So that's, that's one, one certainly important memory. Yeah. Uh, it, it was definitely neat. We did a lot of traveling. We, did, we, we got out of school to do some things, and, and uh, um, it, was, it was fun. He always sings, 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 he always
And this must have been this 1962, probably, yeah. which means he was only four years out of, of, of uh, the Russian competition. He won 58. <laughs> I, I remember, particularly, we were doing a concert, and we had like four people uh, blowing pitch pipes. Really? Three of them came up with the same sound. The fourth one was a, was a, a fourth high. <laughs> it was a fourth, four <laughs> steps high. And we kept shaking him off, and she took his pitch. And I remember the song we sang. Oh, son of God, be da 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 It goes up to, the tender part goes up to an F, which in fourth higher, is a B flat. Okay? Well, she didn't stop us. I thought she's got to stop us because we've got nowhere to go with this song. <laughs> We're going nowhere fast. But she just got out of the way, and I remember Carol Coon, soprano, have a... We need an F, which is a B flat. She sing it. She has to sing a B flat and sing. We just open up. All the sopranos just got out of her way and let her sing it. And uh, I just can't believe it didn't stop and start over again. And, uh, in the concert. In the concert. <laughs> it was a surprise. It, it's unique too that uh, that. People talk about Mrs. Cunningham and what a great musician she was, and she was. We talked about how she could use four chords to get from F major to you know C sharp minor. You know, mm -hmm. she could uh, she just knew her way around. But I never heard her sing, and I wondered what I have heard that she ruined her voice or had, had you know problems with her voice early on, and that's why she didn't sing. Did you do you remember hearing her singing? No, I, I don't I remember ever. Yeah, never a note. Yeah. Boy, she sure knew what was going on. My dad, you know, was a choir director in various places, but he was at the Baptist church longer than any. We oh, were at Marcus First Street. Baptist, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, he was there a long time. Hmm. And, uh, of course, he was a musician. His degree was in music at, from Drake. Uh-huh. Oh, nice. And he not only played in the Big Red Band, he was also in the acapella choir. He had a great voice. He was an amazing voice. Let's get back into the history okay. of your mom and dad <laughs> being in the uh, choir to get, were they there together? Yes, and I think that may have been where they met. Okay. I know they were both in acapella choir. He was a year ahead of her, so he graduated a year before she did. But they were there in the uh, 30s, yeah. so I think one graduated in 39, maybe one 40. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, uh, Mrs. Cunningham already knew about your family history as you came into the high school, and and it would have been no problem for her to have picked you. But what did you take the voice classes? Were you in Mercado or all that stuff before acapella? Or no, no, I don't think so. I just did acapella choir right in the, from yeah. the beginning. And then I did some of the reviews. We did musical reviews, yeah, I remember sure. doing with. And I, I was thinking about the the uh, processional we, we would do with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Yeah. Every time I hear that song, I think about Parkersburg High School and the, and the acapella choir doing sure. that. But you did dance, too. You did <laughs> right. I used to dance, and then I did, well, I did what they called acrobatic things, and I, and I did some shows. We did those minstrel shows that were down at the Smoot Theater uh, when I was like 12 or 13. Hmm. And, uh, Who they would sponsor would, those? It was Ben Bay Grotto, the minstrel. I don't know... Who brought them in? It was they would bring in a director from New York, Gee, and wow. um, and my dad used to do those, and my mm. mother did too, and I remember performing then. And so we didn't have musicals then. And this was kind of before the high schools were doing musicals, and they became a big thing. Uh -huh. And then, of course, we did the senior play, mm -hmm. but uh, the musical reviews I think were part of Mrs. Cunningham and yeah. the and the choir department. I don't yeah. know whether you realize this in high school. When I was 12, I, well, I had started taking dancing at four, and my teacher drove, because there was no studio there, she drove from Charleston, West Virginia, to wow. teach there all the time. Hmm. So when I was 12, she made me her assistant. <clears throat> and then, when I was 15, going into the 10th grade, she said, I'm getting married, I'm not gonna come to, to uh, Parkersburg anymore, I'm going to close the studio. Wow. And all these parents came to me. Now I'm going into the 10th grade and said, would you start a dance studio? And I said, sure. Because, <laughs> I mean, you know, being a girl that can't say no. <laughs> so my dad and I, I, we had a pretty big house. We had a big recreation room and we made it into a dance studio. And I taught for three years. I gave recitals. I had about 50 to 100 students. <laughs> I would print the programs on mimeograph machines. I had reel-to-reel -reel that I would record all the music on. I would rent a place to have them. 
And so I had a dance studio from for three years when I was in high school. So that was when I started producing. That was when I got into wow. putting on shows. And okay. I was doing, I would teach all day Saturday. That would be the whole thing. And I'd be exhausted by the end of the day. <laughs> and you still made good grades in the school. And did you have pretty good average? Oh, yeah. Mine, I was top 10. I was, I had straight A average. And I didn't even realize I was the top there were 10 of us, I guess, that had straight A's. So I went to college and they were telling us, you know, because we didn't have valedictorians or anything, right. that we knew what our, our scores were. And right. when I went to William & Mary, they said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never took those. I took private voice from um, Everhart. Harold um, Everhart. Harold, or his wife. Harold's wife, yes. yes. I had uh, met um, Mrs. Everhart and took voice from her, I guess, all the time I was in high school. But no, I never took any of the, the theory courses or anything like that. So what was your relationship with Mrs. Cunningham like then when you got into high school? Well, uh, at that time when I was at high school, you had to take uh, a music class in 10th grade. Mrs. Gray, was that her? Yes, name? Betty Gray. Mm -hmm. Betty Gray. And in order to get into acapella, so I, I passed the audition and got into uh, acapella choir. But of course, my sister had been in Part, part. So, so she laid the she, she knew me. Yes. She knew who I was. And it's just like being the baby and Bob. Yeah. Shoe in. Oh, exactly. But so you still had the singing auditions. Oh, you did. You yeah. did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> she definitely uh, would choose exactly who she wanted. And there were a hundred of us each year. It wasn't that right. A hundred. I was the only one that could read music when I was eight in grade school so, so I really am a mezzo soprano but they made me an alto because I could sing over yeah. notes I could cite those notes yeah. that's how you end up an alto in grade school sure you sing the harmony part. <laughs> you do you do and yes and my sister was an alto but I sang soprano but we, we did duets as the children Christmas at Christmas time all the time and presented them to my dad who always at Christmas Eve took video of us so I have a Christmas and a summer video of us growing up every single year. confidence in myself uh -huh. and I'm telling you being included in that choir was just the most wonderful thing that anyone ever could have done for my self-confidence. Mm -hmm.
my main thing is I was Esther Cunningham's student assistant. You guys, what, what was always so curious about Esther, uh, we all thought, of course, she also had the choir at our church. Plus, I took piano lessons from her and was her student assistant. I don't know. She was like my second mother. Uh-huh. But the fact that she couldn't sing a lick, <laughs> but yet she taught theory and she taught the acapella choir and and the church choir, and she knew immediately if somebody was singing something wrong. Yeah. And look what she produced, my golly. Yeah. And I'd like to add that I believe Mrs. Cunningham's strong leadership ability was founded upon her highly advanced piano technique and her ability to perceive the musical aptitude of those students who were auditioning for the a cappella choir. The only recording I have found so far of a PHS review was courtesy of Ruth Alio Myers. And on that recording is a very talented ladies quartet singing a very sophisticated four freshman arrangement of Hank Mancini's Moon River. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, here we are in the home of Gene Singer, the uh, the most uh, senior choir director of the Alcapella Choir at Parkersburg High School, and then <laughs> Kathy <laughs> Martin, who was in the choir with me back in the early 60s, and then the most recent director, Pam McLean. I'm anxious to hear from you guys what uh, what things you did and what your personality brought to the choir. <laughs> so, Gene, you should start it off and tell us a little bit about how did you get the job anyway? <laughs> well, I, I graduated from Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey, and I was living there. And um, Mrs. Cunningham called me and wanted to know if I would be interested in coming back to Parkersburg. And my boyfriend was here. <laughs> His name was Don Singer. So I said yes, and she said there's an opening at Jackson Junior High, and uh, uh, would you be interested in doing that? And I had this job in New Jersey where I went around to three schools, and it was a very difficult job. I had, to, I had to drive a long way to my schools. And I lived in Princeton, and so I said yes, and I got my little Volkswagen, and I came back to Parkersburg. And I taught at Jackson one year, and Mrs. Cunningham was in my class every day because she was supervisor of music. And every time, and I'm kind of intense when I teach, and I'd look up and she'd be in the back of the room. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> and uh, so that year she said, Jean, we have an opening at PHS. Would you like to come and teach on there and I said yes I really would love it so I went to PHS and I taught with Betty Metz and Mrs. Martin Wilson and Mrs. Cunningham was still had the choir. I was put into a situation there that was very unique because they had these clubs that were called Marcotta and Lavachi. and There was a Dolce one. Dolce, yeah. yes. <laughs> so I got they always like to stick me stick the young one mm -hmm. with the boys, because the boys were, they they were musical, but yet it was a club. But oh, okay. a lot of them just wanted to sing. Okay. So um, their favorite song was Tie Me Kangaroo Down Sport. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they would say, could we sing that? And I said, yes, after we do all the music that I want you to do, we'll sing it the last two minutes. <laughs> so, uh, and I would come out of the rooms and the other music teachers would be, we were still in the main building. Mm -hmm. The other music teachers would be standing there and they'd all laugh because I looked like I'd been through the mill. <laughs> uh, after that year, um, then Mrs. Cunningham decided she was going to retire. I was absolutely shocked because Mr. Fulton here called me in and said, we think you are the person that should take over the acapella choir. And I would, had been in the choir. I love choral music. I love Mrs. Cunningham, and she was the goddess of music, in my <laughs> opinion. I mean, that's the reason I went into music, was because mm -hmm. of her. Yeah. I took piano lessons from her, and I just adored her. Then I came and I directed a cappella, and I was very nervous. As I told Josh, the new director, boy, you know, when you walk into a classroom and, and after somebody has been there for a long time. Well, Kathy, let's get into yeah, your transition. Yeah, let's get, let's get away well, from first of all, let's establish I am the bridge <laughs> between these two, and I uh, wonderful bridge. <laughs> That's right. I came, I came to this job uh, at age fifty-three, and that yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I'm. What were you the, doing all that time? Well, I had lived twenty years in Charleston, and I had done a private piano. I had done some uh, elementary teaching, uh, kind of paid through the. Uh, PTA. Mm -hmm. I had done church work. And so when we moved up, I told my husband, I said, I think my life is over. I have nothing to do up here. <laughs> well, <laughs> within two months, I had a job at, at, a, at junior high. But did and, you move up because of his work? Yes, yes. It was my family's business. <laughs> and so I, I was out at uh, uh, Leonard Hassett, uh, and it was a wonderful position. It was a wonderful school. And uh, Pam and I both had great uh, junior high choirs then and, and uh, very fortunate. But I will be honest with you, when I came to PHS, it's like I died and gone to heaven. When I retired, 
um, I met with this young lady and said, I, I can't leave if you don't come. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> True, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, when she taught at Blenner House that I was at Edison, and then I was asked to go to Parkersburg South High School, and I was there for eight years. But I was, uh, I was going to say that here's the lineage that you were inspired by Mrs. Cunningham. I was. I was inspired by Jean Singer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why... Mm -hmm. I went into the direction that I went, Absolutely. and I always, I can always remember Pam that. in class, she was intense on everything I said. <laughs> well, these are just all these connections that all yeah. of us have. I mean, yes. I, you know, I went to Esther Cunningham's uh, five, let's see, 530 on every Friday for my lesson, mm. because then she would walk over to the stadium and direct, direct the alma mater. Have to climb up on a bench. How, how did you connect there? Uh, well, Pam and, and I had uh, both been junior high teachers together, and uh, the reason what? that you were thinking you were wanting to get out of it. Tell me that. Well, um, I was sixty years old. <laughs> that was the number one thing. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to be there at the longest. Would have been two more years. It worked out fine, but it's hard to give up. It is hard to give up. I the last year I was there, I made a list. Yes, no, you know, and I and when things would occur to me, why? And of course, the kids and working with the kids was always on the yes column. And we had these terrific, terrific junior high teachers mm -hmm. when I was teaching. We had Jenna Blessing. We had Barbara Full. We had those kids knew how to read by the time they got to voice class, and then you could take them to Bach. You know, I mean, they they were really trained. You can't look at your music all the time. You have to be warming up, and, and that's the tempo of the class. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, with with the, the student, the fast pace of life, you know, you just have to be kind of an entertainer as well as you do an educator because they're, they're you know, they're mm -hmm. fast-paced thinking. Yeah. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you just want to keep them motivated and, and inspired. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think that is the one thing that sets a cappella apart from any other organization in Parkersburg High School is that the tradition of excellence has been maintained and beyond mm -hmm. um, with the caliber of student and um, their pride in its history in wanting to um, to make the mm -hmm. alumni proud and um, uh, that's why you still see the large crowds that turn out for the concert. Especially for Christmas. My granddaughter said to me, she said, you mean people come because they were in the choir? I said, <laughs> not only that, they come because they weren't in the choir. And, uh, yeah. Right. yeah, it makes their Christmas. It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. it's a long history, long, yeah. wonderful Spirit. tradition. Yeah. 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 And let it be known that this was the first high school choir formed in the state of West right. Virginia. Right. <laughs> you know, that's, I always promoted that, yeah. and everyone was so inspired to yeah. know that, that yeah. whenever we traveled.